or just is there. I don't know why it is. I never thought it would happen to me. But <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll be going in another restroom more often. <laughs> yeah, no, well. yeah, that could be one now. <laughs> uh, welcome you who are joining with, uh, with the group that is here this day as we do our continuing study on the Gospel <coughs> of Matthew. And uh, so uh, I'm glad you were able to come in and hear some of our laughter. Laughter is good. It is good medicine. And uh, so we have are looking into, in our study of the Gospel of Matthew, into chapter 17. Yeah. And so before we do so, we just shared some prayer concerns. And I want to remind you that if you want to send some prayer concerns to us, please email them to Kirkville, UMC. It's one word. Uh, UMC is capitalized and K is capitalized. At gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Also, we'd love to hear from you during the study if you're joining with us. We'd ask that you, uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, text in a comment or a question, you may do so by texting 315-345-6534. And so I want to actually begin our reading of chapter 17 after we have some prayer. But what I'm really going to start with is the last verse of chapter 16, and you'll see why. Okay, let's pray. Gracious, loving God, we just thank you for this day. What a beautiful day. It's cold. It's crisp. The sun is shining. It's a glorious day. Each day that we are, to, we are able to live and breathe and just to be able to enjoy the relationships you have given to us and have the opportunity of following you and seeing your wonders in, the, in our world. We give you thanks. We pray that our blessings will outshadow our concerns. We have many concerns. Concerns for our nation, concerns for our families, even some concerns for our church family and members within it who are struggling. Lord, hear our prayers. As we give ourselves more faithfully to you, may we find your presence renewed within us each day. Be with us as we study your word. Make it become clear to us as we apply it to our lives today. And this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what we did is that we ended chapter 16 with Jesus pre predicting uh, his death. And what happens is that we find that the uh, Peter first confessed, okay, uh, a great confession that Jesus is who he is, the Son of God, um, the Messiah. Uh, but then, uh, and then the Lord rewarded him for that, that profession, you know, and reminded him that the only reason he came to that conclusion was not on his own, but by the Holy Spirit. That's an important saying, because it means that whenever we think about someone coming to faith in Christ, or going on to a deeper faith, um, there are things that we can do to facilitate that, but we can't make anyone come to faith. We can only witness to what we find Christ doing in our lives, and then uh, we can only love in Christ's name. And that's why Jesus said in the beginning of Matthew, let your light so shine that all who see it, put it on, uh, don't hide it, but put it out there. And that becomes a concern for prayer too, as we're living in a time, I'm reading a book right now called Good Faith. And uh, what it's about is how we can live faithfully as Christians in a, in a culture that looks at us as being increasingly irrelevant and extreme. And I think that's going to continue. And as I mentioned to you downstairs a little bit, um, the more people that do this, evangelize, it, it, it makes people feel better and puts a smile on their face. It is. And, but we, and we have to be careful about how we do that. Yes. And we need to not shy away from verbalizing our faith. We need to do it in good deeds. But you can do good deeds for a lot of different reasons, not just out of Christ. So it's important that Christians lead by good deeds, but we also do not silence our voices. And we proclaim the truth of why we are living as we are, why we do the good that we do, because it is our faith in Christ. So after Peter made that wonderful um, pronouncement, declaration of faith, all of a sudden Jesus began to talk about the fact he was going to die. 
And then all of a sudden, Peter then explained, no way, Jose, is that going to happen? <laughs> and then Jesus turns around and says to Peter, you son of Satan, get behind me. You don't have in mind the things of God and the things of men. So we find within the example of Peter two different things that we have to watch out for. We can be very strong in our proclamation and our belief of who Jesus is, and that's good. But we also have to recognize that any given time, we can go against the will of God. If we have we go against the will of God at any particular point, we then and accept that, then we become a tool of Satan. So every moment and every decision that we have when we live, we either become uh, pronounce uh, the glory of Christ and God, or else become an instrument used by the devil. And so being a follower of Christ, this is important, is that we are both. There are times that our witness will be strong and we can be proud of in a godly sense, but there's many times in which we have to watch because sometimes we can do more discredit to the cause of Christ if we are not willing to follow his will. With that, uh, it doesn't mean that that Peter was condemned. We know that's not the case. Neither are we when we fail to do what God wants us to do. But it's just important for us to realize that uh, each day we have the opportunity to represent and proclaim Christ faithfully, or we can fail to do so. And that's good for us to remember. Uh, As he ends that, he says, uh, the Son, Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory. He talks about his return in verse 27, with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So even if you're a believer like Peter, we're going to be rewarded according to what we have done. That makes you think, doesn't it? It should. should. Um, should. As my friend A.W. Tozer said, you know, I believe in grace. Grace is God's gift to us. But you can overemphasize grace that you forget our responsibility to live what God would have us to live. It's a balance between living by grace and then also doing good. We were created, so Paul said in the the letter to Ephesians, for doing good works. Good works does not save us. Our faith does. Our good works are to stem from our faith. And other people can do good work. Good works should come out of our faith? Come come from our faith. Mm -hmm. The book that I'm reading right now, I just mentioned good faith. He mentioned, uh, brings out uh, Chuck Colson, who's no longer with us, and uh, became a very strong Christian apologist. And he he designated there are two different types of grace. There's more than that. In the Wesleyan sense, we have several different types, like sanctifying grace, saving grace. But Chuck Colson brought up the issue of there being um, uh, saving grace and common grace. And what he meant by common grace is that you do not necessarily have to follow Christ to do good. Mm. There's common grace that we all experience. But the difference is is that when we follow Christ, we uh, we are following, uh, we are doing the good because of our saving grace Mm. uh, and our thankfulness for what we have received. There's a danger in common grace and that we can have mixed motives. We won't go there. And even, even as a Christian, we can have mixed motives. There are some Christians who feel the better, more good I do, then that means I can be on a higher rung in heaven than Eddie or Cindy or whatever. That's not of God. That's of the world. And so sometimes bad faith is practice. And this book was advocating good grace. And that's what our world needs now. So good is not a matter of just a, uh, that Christians can do good. But Christians should excel in doing good. That should be one of our distinguishing characteristics. And they're bringing it up in that book because for most part, most people who are unchurched do not necessarily see that the church is doing much good. They're blind to it. We are. We can remind them of it. But the very fact they see more of the judgmental legalism, however, we, how we treat our neighbor, uh, we need to exhibit more good faith. Okay? So when he, as he says that, he says, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death, death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 
And I'll repeat that. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, obviously, um, those who are there have died. So how do you reconcile that? All those that were there at the time that heard Jesus say this are dead. But Jesus said, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. But they were, I mean, alive when he said it to them. Yes. Yeah. But his kingdom hasn't come, has it? No. Yeah. They believe it. They should believe it. But they're mm-hmm. the disciples. They, they, they get it. you got to knock them on the head. Yeah. Some would say this as the <laughs> many unbelievers or non-church would say, this is the reason why we can't trust the Bible. Because even the words of Jesus, because Jesus was wrong. Because he died, and if we and believe the resurrection went to heaven, um, those people also died, and they didn't see the coming of his kingdom. They were reluctant to even give it a try. No, I'm yeah, talking, I'm referring to the fact that, that the coming of the kingdom referring to the second coming. Okay. okay. Well, that, that, yeah, doesn't, doesn't the majority of people feel that there is going to be, there is going to be a second coming? Even the... There's a lot of people who disbelieve and a lot of critics of Christianity and the word who would point out such passages like that as saying, see, you folks are wrong. This guy's misdirected. When, you know, uh, like in Revelations, when the kingdom does come, Mm -hmm. we won't all be dead. Some of, I mean, I don't want to be dead. You know, there'll be people here and then he can decide, you know, he's going to separate the, you know, who goes... Which way? <laughs> but they would have understood it as those who were standing there listening right. to Jesus saying that some of us are going to see the kingdom of come, coming are here yeah. Yeah. before we die. So the reason why I make that mention to you is because sometimes there's someone who might be you talk to that might raise that criticism. See all these people that talk about the coming of the second coming of Christ, mm-hmm. but it's been 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. You guys believe that he's going to be coming any time, but he hasn't come. What do we answer? How do we respond? Whether you respond to them or whether you just need that information for yourself, the answer is found in the next passage in chapter 17. Let's listen to it. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before him, them, His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses, Elijah, talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, he always asked over his mouth, right? (laughs) He said, "Um, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground. Terrified, because Je- but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. One of the answers to that question, well, what happened? He promised that he was going, they were, that some that were living right then and there would not die before they saw the kingdom of heaven. And they did. They did, yeah. Peter, James, and John, six days later, went with Jesus up the Mount of Transfiguration, and there he was transfigured before them, appeared with Moses and Elijah. They saw the kingdom of heaven coming, and they heard the voice declaring, the kingdom is in my son. You know, listen to him. Now, to take this apart, this is very important uh, to realize. Where, where did this happen? Mm-hmm. Think back in your history um, of uh, biblical history. Uh, what happened on mountains in the past? <laughs> Lots of good things. I mean, Moses, good things. Moses and the, the Ten Commandments. Okay, so Bush. what happened is that uh, Moses went up on the yeah. mountain and there he received um, the uh, Ten Commandments. Yeah. We call it the Ten uh, Commandments. So that happened going up the mountain. Mm-hmm. All right. 
Uh, Elijah, he went up on the mountain too. Yeah. What happened when he went up on the mountain? <laughs> he pulled off. <laughs> he took him off, right? That's what well, that was a little bit later. Yeah, but I mean, but was he up on the mountain? He went up on the mountain, and he was in discouragement. Oh, okay. And then all of a sudden, there was a storm on the mountain. Hmm. And as the word says uh, in Kings, that and God was not in the storm. Okay. Hmm. Then there was a still small voice. Hmm. God was in the still, small oh, voice. Boy. So God revealed himself on the mountain. Okay, So mountains uh, play an important role in biblical history as being um, where God reveals himself. Um, many look at the mountain and the smoke that was around it and the fire that they saw, um, that the people were terrified. Uh, some would say that there was a volcano. And then all of a sudden, Moses was called up to the mountain, okay, near the volcano. Hmm. And uh, you find that Jesus went up <coughs> on the mountain. Right? So the mountains are places where, um, um, where God has made particular revelation to people. There's the Mount of Calvary, where Christ died. Well, it's not a real tall mountain, yet it's called the Mount of Calvary, because it's you could be down below and you could see what was happening. Uh, mountains always played a significant role. So Jesus took them up on the mountain intentionally so that they would see what he was about to show them. Right? And so we also find that God in the Old Testament um, led the people by a pillar of cloud <coughs> during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And so we find that the description of, of that here is very important. And so as he was there, his clothes shined white as light. He had just washed them on the way up with Clorox, and they were <laughs> bright and shiny. Of course, that doesn't mean is he, they were white and light, because light is an image of truth. You know, in darkness, we can't see our way. <coughs> We stub our toes. But with the light, we can see reality and truth. And so that's what light always means within the Bible. He became white as light. He stood out, in other words. That's the best way of putting it is that he stood out. And then there was Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, why Moses and Elijah? Why those two characters? Um, Moses, we got we just talked about when he went up on the mountain, yeah. he came down, what did he bring with him? Okay, or the law. So we see Moses <coughs> is the law. Okay? Ten commandments, the Torah. Just the law of every for everyone. Now who was Elijah? There's a problem. Very good. And so we have our Old Testament is divided into law, prophecy, and then there's some narrative things in the middle like Psalms and stuff. But law and the prophet, uh, prophecy, mm -hmm. the prophets consisted mm -hmm. of um, the Bible, the word, mm -hmm. which um, the Jews had at that time. You know, we didn't have the New Testament. So all of a sudden, Jesus stands there with Moses. He represents the law. He was a famed figure. Okay? Uh, and then there's Elijah. Now, Elijah may not have written. There's not as much written about Elijah and what he did compared to, like, Isaiah or Jeremiah, the larger prophets. However, he's the only prophet, as you mentioned, all of a sudden he, he didn't die. He disappeared. Hmm. Okay? Disappeared out of sight. And so it was believed by the Jews that before the Messiah would come, that Elijah would come first. And, uh, and, reappeared. Before, hmm? and reappeared to the people. Reappeared, yes. 
and uh, as prophecy. Now they hadn't heard prophecy, a prophet, for 600 years. Wow. It had been silent. God had been silent. What happens when you live your life for a long time and you want to hear God and you don't hear from God? You begin to doubt, don't you? Doubt, doubting and discouragement. Doubt, and discouragement, and whatever. So they were looking, always looking for Elijah. Matter of fact, today, though it wasn't the original prescription when they did the Passover meal, but uh, um, the Passover meal uh, <clears throat> that was celebrated by every family during Passover, um, they would have an empty chair, the Elijah chair, a chair for Elijah, waiting for the prophet to come. So that's one reason why um, uh, John the Baptist was so important. And Jesus, we read of earlier in Matthew, Jesus saying, and if you can accept it, John the Baptist is the spirit of Elijah. So he was saying to those Jews that were looking for Elijah, Elijah has already come in John the Baptist. And who was supposed to follow after Elijah? The Messiah. Guess what? I'm here. You get what he's saying? Mm -hmm. See, so we need to know the history to really comprehend what is what takes place as we read the scriptures. So, so Moses re represents the law, and so the past, where Elijah represents the prophecy of what's to come. What to the expect prophecy. Yes. What's to come. And what happens is then all of a sudden there's a voice from heaven, and the voice was heard in a cloud. What did God? How did God speak to Moses in the cloud? How did uh, uh, God speak to Elijah uh, on that mountain in a cloud? But it wasn't in the storm, but in a still small voice. Um, and so what happens is that uh, out of the cloud comes this voice. <coughs> this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. Follow him. As opposed to following the law or following the prophet. Follow him. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Jesus said, and we read that earlier in Matthew, I think we read it earlier in Matthew, um, that uh, I did not come to end the law, mm -hmm. but to fulfill it. You see? So what he was saying to these disciples, okay, you're Jews, and what you've experienced as Jews, what you've learned, what you, has been revealed to you through your faith is good. But now, put that aside. You're to follow Jesus. So what happens is when I read the law, and you and I read the law or the prophets, we read them and understand them through the lens of Jesus. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just like in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, they, Jesus <coughs> talked about the law. Jesus was clarifying the law. He was applying the law. And so, because he is able to explain the purpose and the meaning of the law. Okay? Mm -hmm. So a lot of those other laws that were in the Old Testament, I do not have to follow. You know, I can eat Piggly Wiggly. Um, <laughs> you know, things like that. Those, those uh, I follow Jesus Christ. Okay? Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is the one who interprets. We interpret the laws through the teachings and the actions of Jesus. So why Jesus was able to say when they questioned him about the Sabbath, your you folks are your your disciples are not washing their hands. We just read that. Okay. Um, as is our traditions. He criticized them for following their traditions and missing the point. <laughs> so also we can be very good at following legalistically the law and miss the whole point of the law. Okay. And so what he's he had these three uh, observed this so they would see the kingdom was come in Jesus. So the fulfillment of that promise that some would not taste death before they saw the kingdom of heaven. They saw the kingdom of heaven. They saw Moses, they saw Elijah, they saw Jesus, and Jesus stood out. And we were told by God, he is to stand out above all these. Now, if you're a religious Jew, and Matthew's writing this to, what are you hearing? 
you, you tell me that all that I've lived my life by, while it's important, I now need to put aside to following this, this man. Okay? And so Matthew's trying to tell them, if it's good that you're Jews, God wants you to follow his son, Jesus. So he's making, he's taking a claim for the prominence or preeminence of Jesus over religion. Let me put that. He's establishing the priority for us of following Jesus over religion. Religion is an expression of the faith we have inside. Okay? But religion can become corrupt, misused, uh, abused. We are to follow Jesus. And if we follow Jesus, then the religion that comes out from our faith will not be corrupt. Will be semi perfect and correct. But we're going to be just like Peter, like above. Mm-hmm. We're going to say, Yeah, we know who you are, Jesus. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, we're going to trip over ourselves because mm-hmm. we're not going to accept the will that God might have. Yeah. Now, we had that prayer yeah. concern about Judah. Yeah. And what I noted when I read that, I, you know, I don't mm-hmm. know, I know her, grand, her dad, mm-hmm. but Kate and Wesley, uh, I admire their faith. In the midst of having to lose a son, um, they proclaim their faith. I mean, they publicly proclaim their mm-hmm. faith mm-hmm. and their assurance of what was going to happen. And there are those who are going to maybe similarly have crises in their life. Maybe the faith that this couple is, is expressing and practicing, not just saying the words, but practicing, will also move and touch someone's heart yeah. so that they might follow Jesus Christ. Well, they put that out on Facebook and they yeah. have like about 35 comments already. Yes. Yeah, yeah right. Other, others, others around them. Some, yeah. of them. some of them don't even fully yeah. know them. So here, are we supposed to despair of a lot of bad things happen in social media? No. But we as Christians in good faith can use social media to be able to do good. Right. That's 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 our task. That's our challenge. Um, so I just have you remember that. Mm-hmm. So this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. I know he's not always well pleased with me. <laughs> but then there's grace. Okay? And so we live by grace. Because of the grace that I've experienced, I want to follow Jesus. I want to fulfill the law, not because of the letter of the law, but because the law, the motivation of the law is right. And I want to then follow it because God wants me to have abundance in my life. And abundance is not necessarily material possessions. But he wants me to have a quality of life that I can know in this world. And once you understand that, you'll feel better about it. Yep. No, I can say my relationship with my wife... um, (coughs) I am so thankful for her. And because it's, it's, it's by grace, God's grace, that I have her in my life. Mm-hmm. So this is my Valentine's gift to her, though she's not going to hear this. She <laughs> might. <laughs> <Sorry. Sorry. laughs> but um, what happens is that how we live our relationships gives witness and testimony you know, to Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. How we in the church, the physical church, people are not going to be impressed with the building. But they can be impressed with the relationships mm-hmm. that we have with one another. God is concerned about the quality of our relationships mm-hmm. less than our expression of how we do that. <coughs> Whether all of a sudden Charlie has stands in front of the camera with his back, so we see his back, and, and, and while he's lighting the candles, and, and he has a difficulty lighting the candles, no, that doesn't mean a hill of beans. It really is not the important thing. See, it's important to stress the right things. That's what honors God. Any questions? Well, from what I just said? Okay. Now we continue on with verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, you know what's interesting? Here, they went up the mountain and encountered God. You know, oftentimes when we look at the mountaintop, we call them mountaintop experiences. 
Those are the places where we feel God is really close. Right? Oh, so good. <laughs> you know, we want to keep those mountaintop experiences. Right? <clears throat> That's another reason why Peter said it is good for us to be here. Let me build three shelters. Not going to be there. That That's right. That's very good. Yeah, we're not going to be there that long. We don't need to be shelters. I, I brought you here because I, I wanted you to see this, experience this. I want you to listen, though. Pay attention. Okay? And what he was doing, he was treating Jesus, right? Offering to go three shelters. He was treating Jesus, Elijah, Elijah and Moses on the same plane. But Jesus is supposed to stand out. You get that? You understand that? Mm-hmm. So anyway, so as there, uh, we can't stay up on the mountain. Mm-hmm. We have to come down into the valley. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so when he comes down the mountain, uh, Jesus instructed them, "Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead." Again, we can understand why, because what he just showed them was who he really was. And if they go around spitting that out so plainly, it would facilitate his death. And God has a plan and a will. So that take, let's take that to our witness. I'm witnessing to someone. I, I'm, I'm thinking of someone in particular that I've been working on and witnessing to. And you know, I've got to be careful how I do it. I've got to plant the seeds. I've got to cultivate the opportunity. But at some point, there's going to be that opportunity where I can just come right out and say, this is who I know Jesus Christ to be. They already know I feel that way about Jesus. But I'm going to be able to express it. I've earned the right to be heard. Okay? So what happens, there's a time to declare the truth, and there's time not to. There's a time to, there's always a time they might be on a to love. They might be on a different level of understanding. They may not have gone through mm-hmm. the Christ. And if I, preempt, if, you, if I preempt my witness, okay, I could actually turn them away and turn them off. Because then, right, then they then they might feel like they're not they're not being heard. Their thoughts, their that's right. So in our relationships, we build relationships. Mm-hmm. We listen. We become involved in their life. They become involved in our life. And at the right opportunity, which God and the Holy Spirit will show us, there'll be a time to say, <laughs> you know, I've I've seen and heard Jesus. Oh, come on, now you're nuts. <laughs> Let me tell you how I've heard and seen him. Okay, and then you've earned the right to hear to, for them to hear you. But at the same time, we must be active in creating those opportunities. It doesn't mean we just sit back. Well, Jesus just hasn't given me an opportunity yet. That means we're just not looking for one. We can't give excuses. What's my favorite? One of my favorite sayings: God don't play games. We play games. God don't. So don't play games with God. He already knows what's going on in you, anyways. Why bother playing the game? Okay? So, um, then the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, (coughs) Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. But then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Does it all come together a little bit better? Mm-hmm. 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 Now we come to verse 14. The healing of a boy with a demon. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Ooh. Now, what's the importance here? Why is this follow after the uh, Jesus being transfigured. It stands out to me is unbelieving. Unbelieving. Okay. How can we believe and be unbelieving? Well, 
they're putting you're basically putting your putting what you want in your situation before God. Okay. We can believe well, in Jesus and that he's someone special, but you might not believe in everything he can do. Jesus says if you had the faith, small as a mustard seed, mm-hmm. you could say that this mountain move from here. Mm-hmm. Now I do not presume <clears throat> now, I'm going to go to some mountain and I'm going to say, <laughs> Jesus said I can move that mountain some more. Okay? <laughs> Jesus is speaking figuratively. But he's not just figurative. What mountains are there that we face? Any big problems that you face yeah. are a mountain. Okay. And you have to do your best to move Yes, yeah, especially yeah. through the mind. Okay. Now, here's a boy that had uh, touched by a demon. Whatever that might translate to in a modern psychological terms, the boy had problems. He had seizures. He was causing harm to himself. What people do you know that by their choices and their actions, I talked about this the other week in my sermon, that may be making the wrong choices, that may be hurting themselves. And we love them. It doesn't have to be big things that they do, but if there are people who we just kind of shake our head inside ourselves and say, why did they make that choice? The unbelievers, the unchristians. They're hurting themselves. Don't they see that? No, they don't. They're hurting themselves? No, they don't. Why are they pursuing that relationship? Why are they putting sexuality before, before really a depth of relationship? Why are they uh, uh, proceeding to... to surrender themselves to, uh, in order to be accepted by this group of people over here mm-hmm. when they shouldn't. Because those, they're giving up what they really believe. They're losing their soul in order to get along with the group. Okay? Puts them on a pedestal. Puts them on a pedestal. We all want to be accepted. Yeah, let's get we all want to belong. We don't want to be a minority. Um... I have news for you. I think being a Christian, like uh, a disciple of Jesus Christ, is going to be increasingly a, we're going to be a minority. Mm-hmm. We're the new minority. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I, th- I think there are some people that they aren't the life they're living. They don't want to live it. They don't have the strength to get out of it. They, they don't have the strength to get out of it. They don't have mm-hmm. the faith in, in Jesus and. Oh. Um, like that. that maybe an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, do we really want to think they want to live that way? Uh, maybe it's an escape for them, for the life mm-hmm. that's around them that mm-hmm. they haven't been able to mm-hmm. uh, change or to, you know, they mm-hmm. you know. But I have another question. Okay. A person of faith mm-hmm. can still have questions. Yes. Yeah, okay. That's why I preached last time. I was going to say uh, your your questions of you know of the week there, and because uh, I was going to ask that question last week, we got onto something else, and I'm like, oh, okay, here he goes. He's going to answer me now. <laughs> but, um, Abram, Abram had uh, was that perfect in his his choices? He had faith, and the faith was counted to him as righteousness. But he still had questions. How is this going to happen? Mary at the Annunciation. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, I believe you can do this. Uh, how's it going to happen? So having some questions or doubt doesn't exclude us from being faith. Faith. having faith and being righteous. That means that some, I'll uh, give you an example. Sometimes I have a choice. I could make this choice and I wouldn't get caught. It's not necessarily wrong. But I'm not so confident that it's right. Mm-hmm. But I really, you know, but it's going to be expedient if I do that. And so sometimes we, we make those choices. Okay? And, and so uh, we doubt ourselves. And sometimes we should doubt ourselves. Um, you know, so that doubt is part of our experience of living in faith. But what happens is that. Even when I, even when I don't understand why I could do this, it'd be better for me. Why wouldn't God want me to do this? And then all of a sudden, there's that other side that says, "No, because it's not right." But dang it, God, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And and um, and so what happens is we follow our righteousness by faith. I do this by faith. I'm obedient, even when I don't understand why. Okay, I'm obedient, even when I don't understand why. That becomes hard. Um, when it doesn't seem logical to us or reasonable to us to deny ourselves to be able to do this or that. I, I, I don't want to get into specific examples, but I think you can find some in your, you know. When we deny ourselves, what, what, say that again? Sometimes we, we look at things in faith and we say, why does God want me to do it this way and not? Why can't I do this? And it doesn't seem to be any reason that we can find. But by faith, we then obey. That's why they said that but Abraham, he, yeah, but. he credited his faith as righteousness. Because if we have faith, we will then obey our faith and we will be righteous. Even when we, our decisions prove not to be righteous, you know, there's grace. That's, that's the parts that we're taught not to question, to, to leave it in Jesus and God's hands. And some people without faith, I don't think understand that. So but then again, if we do have faith, we can still question. Yes. Yes. You know? Yes. I can yes. still question why this. You know, I yes. I believe that. Uh, but um, yeah. I can ask like that family oh, we're yeah. talking yes. about the, right. the loss of, of the son. Okay, I lost the son. Mm -hmm. One and a half. Uh, I can ask why all I want, and I have asked why, and I still will ask why. Um, but how I respond to that incident in my life is mm -hmm. by faith. Just as, I'm sure they're hurting, but they're responding by faith, and they gave witness to the confidence. But do you think they ever have a question in their head, Maybe, will, I be, will I see him? Mm -hmm. You know, is there resurrection? And, and, you know, we have questions. But what happens is, by faith, we choose to believe. You understand me? Sometimes believing is a choice. It, and it doesn't helps, come yeah. easily. It helps us go on. Helps us go on. But more than that, it helps us to respond in helpful ways. If they they could have responded in a way that is not faithful, and they would just give ammunition mm -hmm. for other people mm -hmm. not to believe. Mm -hmm. They're being faithful. Mm -hmm. And even if they have some doubts in their mind and heart, mm -hmm. okay, they're being faithful. God will honor that faithfulness. I've seen it over and over and over again. So it's not a matter of whether we have some doubts. It's what we do with them. And then it can become contagious and spread. Yes. Slightly, respectfully. You know, we need to, um, we respond righteously to every situation we find ourselves. Okay. Um, so, by unbelieving and perverse generation, Perverse because they didn't care about this boy so much. When we come to the point where we don't care about the suffering of someone else, mm -hmm. only what it means to us, we're perverse. That's not love. Um, unbelieving because they just saw what Jesus could do. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be that Jesus is saying, well, you should have had enough faith that you could have just taken this demon out. But what this says to me that in my life, that I sometimes wonder, here's a doubt, is my faith enough? As I'm talking to someone that has a problem, let's say it was Eddie who came and has a, has a problem in a counseling meeting, do I have faith enough that together with Jesus we can find the answer? That we can make life better? That we can find healing and wholeness? Can I talk to someone who's really made some bad choices? And so they've been, <clears throat> they're following demons, okay? Do I give up hope that maybe through caring and compassion and service and that God can't break through? You see, sometimes we doubt. And so I said, well, I can never do that. My faith isn't strong enough that, they're gonna, that that's going to make a difference. And then what happens is we're being unbelieving. I believe that Jesus can heal our nation. 
I believe that faith can heal our nation. I believe that the power of the church to stand up for what is right and true, not taking sides, can be part of the healing of our nation. Do you believe that? I do. And if I believe that, then I need to follow my faith and practice it. Even more so, my country at this time needs the church to practice its faith, good faith, going back to that book, not bad faith, but good faith. Does that make sense? That's what I think Jesus was saying. He wasn't saying, oh, you should have just been out of jail, heal that boy. But they, they didn't even try. They didn't try to, to work with the child. They didn't try to understand what was going on. They, 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 didn't, they, they, they didn't have enough compassion. And that becomes perverse. They want to first push him off into a corner yeah. and ignore him. So that's why I think he said that. Uh, so Jesus rebuked the demon as only Jesus could do, mm -hmm. okay? And um, he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, in private, you know this, in private, because <laughs> uh, they're embarrassed. <laughs> Jesus said the, wor the words out loud, everyone could hear. hear. Now they come to out of embarrassment and privacy <laughs> to Jesus. Why couldn't we drive it out? Because you have so little faith. You didn't even try. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. What I question when I read that is, what have I relegated to impossibility? In counseling a couple that I have had in uh, the past month or so, um, you know, she doesn't think that anything will ever change. It's impossible. Do we stop trying? No. Do we have faith enough to see what can happen? Yes, there are times in which relationships are going to fall apart. I'm not you saying can, and you can try some different things or some different avenues. Different but, ways of looking at things. You know, sometimes we're too ready to give up. When love means that we need to keep working. Too easy to change relationships, get out of relationships into work. Yeah. Back in our day, we had a problem with your husband. No, we worked it out. <laughs> we didn't run to a lawyer yep. immediately, you know. Well, I can tell you a story out. from Kentucky. I won't tell you that because some people hate me for saying it. Still <laughs> mm -hmm. 59 years later. And what? What a church did in healing a bunch. But anyways. Um, yeah. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. So anything is impossible. That doesn't, you know, if it's God's will, the impossible, what we think is impossible is God's will, then it will happen. Yes, there are times in which God will not go against his will. Because God has a greater purpose. I don't always understand. That's where some of my doubts come from come from. I don't understand, understand what God's will is. Why God? Why did they have to happen in this way? And I may not understand the reasons at the time, but faith says I'm going to continue on and as according to Abraham his faith is counted to him as righteousness. Okay. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple task, tax? Um, I don't know if Peter really knew, but he said, yes, he does. I'm going to check with Jesus. I'm not going to say, no, he doesn't. Hey, you won't. You know, now, be careful what you say. Uh, when Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? So he must have heard. Or just knew intuitively. He asked, From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? From others. <laughs> Peter answered, Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to them. <laughs> but so that we may not offend them, you go and take and throw out your line. <laughs> take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drop of coin. Take it and give it to them 
from my tax and yours. Well, let's go fishing. I like let's that. Go fishing. <laughs> yeah. Let's go fishing. I like so that. <laughs> in the springtime here, when tax finally yeah. due, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're going to have a. We're all going to go over the Erie Canal, okay. and we're going to go fishing and collect a lot of coin. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is important there is to realize um, this this two drachma tax mm -hmm. was used to support um, uh, the efforts of religion. Um, their religion. Okay. So all of a sudden, those who, the temple tax. So what happened is that uh, these Jews uh, reading this would understand that automatically, where we okay. could not. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, he's just drawing uh, the fact that from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? Well, everyone pay taxes, right? Well, there's some people who can get around them somewhat. We won't go there. Go over there either. Um, <laughs> and so for their own, you know, they'll, they'll impose it upon others while they themselves will make it easy for themselves. Uh, what he was also saying is that this tax was levied by the religious leaders, okay, upon the common people. Right. They are the sons, okay, they are the sons. Mm -hmm. So, um, whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own sons or from others? From others. Okay. So in other words, they were collecting this tax from the common people for their own particular use in the hierarchy um, of religion. I'm trying to be very careful here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, but, verse 27, but so that we may not offend them, Go to the lake and throw your, out your line. So in other words, uh, trust that God is going to provide. Um, righteousness is doing, even though there is injustice, Jesus is saying, you see some injustice. Uh, you see injustice. Uh, still, it's your responsibility to pay the tax. Okay? Even if there is injustice, you see. And what, how it's used. Correct. How it's collected. <clears throat> you understand? Mm -hmm. Um you know, so what we do is we we want to change the person, and if we change the person, then or persons, then their actions will be different. If we are living according to our faith, so he doesn't want to offend them because um, it's, it, it is important that we are able to keep uh, relationship. So, take that back to my witnessing to someone, or your witnessing to someone. <coughs> I can take offense at what someone might be saying. They might even attack my faith. Immediately, I might want to strike back. I might want to defend God. Instead, I don't want to offend them. And so, there may be sometimes, if someone brings up all the bad things that happened in religion, I may have to, like, uh, the abuse by Catholic priests of um, young boys. I can't justify it or run around it. Sometimes what I need to do is just to say, yeah, is that terrible? But do you think that God would really want that? Do you think that they were really following God? So you change, you don't act defensively, you are changed to reshape and refocus. Yes, I agree with you. That's horrendous. That's abnormal. That was not right. What a shame. It hurts the church as well as hurting the individuals that they abuse. Okay? Um, I agree with you. But then again, I don't think that was of God. They may represent, have represented God in their position, but they don't represent God. You see? So we have an opportunity of returning without offending and are able to then continue the conversation that brings people towards faith. You understand that? So Jesus said, I'm not going to offend these who are reading Matthew. I'm going to pay the tax. Because what I want is I want their souls. I want their lives. And then all of a sudden, all this doesn't matter. Picking one's battles is because of part of the wisdom of faith. There are some battles to fight, and there are some battles how you fight is defined by, you know, patience, thinking things through, 
and doing what is right. That's a, that's a tough one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them from my tax and yours. Now, there's generosity in that. They asked, doesn't your master pay the tax? Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, he does. But Jesus wasn't just paying his tax. He was paying Peter's tax. It was generosity. Paying the forward generosity. So that is, to me, is the rule that's here, is that each of our responses to those challenges we find in life, we respond by faith. We, find, we respond by trying to build relationships so we earn the right to be heard. And then we're also generous. Uh, I'm going to be generous. I choose to be generous to the person who may attack my, my faith. And maybe you haven't had people attack your faith so much, but I know in my position, blah, 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 blah. I get, I get, I get, I've get, been attacked many times. Okay. I didn't expect I will be. But I want to give a faithful response. Mm -hmm. I always want them to know, the person that might be attacking me, that I care for them. That they are important to me. And they're important to God. And they're important to me because God's important to me. Now with that, I just want to take us on a little road trip. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Back to uh, chapter 5, verse 43. I'm going to take uh, verse 38, excuse me. You have heard it said, I for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Uh, that's in Exodus, okay? As Moses, they brought down the Ten Commandments, and then he also explained some other laws that they were to follow in their relationships as a community. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That means um, Charlie hurt me, so... He knocked out my tooth, so I'm going to cut off his ears. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, talking about, it's talking about balance of justice. Not that, okay, you got my eye, I'm going to get yours. Only thing we get is two black eyes. You know, what it's talking about there is a balance of justice. I'm not going to exact more from you. And some people can get what you burn. Some people can get so defensive when there's nothing even to be defensive about. They just didn't hear or understand how you're speaking it. True. Or explaining it. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn <clears> to him also the other. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. What if it's not right? In other words, Jesus is advocating that sometimes we take abuse. I'm not saying we're always to take abuse. I'm not advocating that. Jesus would be advocating that too. But uh, sometimes we need to take it on the chin that for analogy. Um, because we're looking at trying how can we best witness to these people? How can I create a relationship that might transcend the moment? I think of some stories that I've, I've seen of people like dealing with bullies. And one particularly nice story is that he eventually took his the van became, the boy became his friend, took him home, found he didn't have a father. Mm -hmm. And he was just angry and striking out because his dad went off to war and he was alone with his mom. And so they came in understanding and they became the best of friends. If he had struck back, that wouldn't have happened. We have to choose our battles. We have to choose our battles and make sure we choose the right ones. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And so that helps you understand what Jesus was really trying to say. And so we um, return good for evil. And sometimes that means that we take some abuse. There's some times in which someone abuses us, but we <coughs> bear it. And then maybe it's like they'll come back eventually and say, no, I'm sorry for that. Maybe they'll never say they're sorry but they change how they act. Well, they should say they're sorry. I'm not going to until they say they're sorry. Sometimes, what's that from a movie, Brian's son? Love is 
never having to say you're sorry. Yeah. It doesn't mean you don't act as if you were sorry and change how you <coughs> live. Okay? But sometimes some people can't say the word I'm sorry, but will change how they act. That's the most important thing. I judge people by how what they do, not necessarily by what they don't always say. Okay? So Jesus is giving a radical way of life and relationships. All this is relational, and we need to understand that. It's not about the temple tax. He's talking about putting himself in a place where he can witness most effectively with integrity to those people about the most important thing. So if all of a sudden I feel my tax bill is too large, I have means I can go and post a grievance, you know. But it doesn't mean I'm just going to, I'm not refuse to pay my tax. You know? We need to respond in our society, in relationships, and also in greater society with calm, with confidence, with love. Um, and so I can look at what goes on in our culture right now, and I can see how much this culture needs Jesus Christ. Because all I see is hate. All I see is retaliation. All I see is an eye for an eye, even more than an eye for an eye. I see brutality. I worry for our culture, as I know you do too. But who is going to be those who live out our relationships with sanity, with calm, composure, and allow others to experience forgiveness, restoration. Who is it that's going to proclaim the message of love? Us. Because that's what we've been called to do. It's not always an easy place to live. And we'll be misunderstood. And we'll be criticized. So it wasn't Jesus isn't it better to be criticized for Jesus' sake and the values of Jesus than to be silent and have people just think so good of us or ignore us, which is what most of the culture is doing. Now, do you have any questions? Do you have any responses? We can go on through chapter 17. So I don't want to belabor it. Anything that you think of that you'd like to apply to this? There's mountains that we see in, I see in my life. There's mountains that I see in the lives of those, some people that I love. I see I mountains in our culture. But I have belief. I have I faith think mountain, that they can I think there's a mountain for a lot of people, but some people, I think we've all said, it's like they're, they're reluctant to come to counseling. They're reluctant to, to talk about it and get it out and get stronger in, in faith and coming, and coming to Bible studies. How about we ask in prayer? Yes. Gracious loving God, we thank you for your word. It challenges us. It reveals to us how we've got to walk above that which our culture lives. <clears throat> and even if we are ridiculed, even if we are ignored, even if we are a minority, <clears throat> give us the courage to love our neighbor as you love them, you love them so much that you gave your own son and he gave his own life for them as well as for us. Help us to go the extra mile. Help us to swallow our pride. Help us to do the work of planting, preparing the soil, of making it right so when we plant the seed under the guidance of your Holy Spirit, it has the best opportunity to grow and bear fruit. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful. And as we try to be faithful, so the word you said to Abram will also be said of us. God credited our faith as righteousness. Make us righteous, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Yes, see any more people. Oh, okay. I didn't see anyone logging out this time. Pam or Adriana. Angelina.
was he called me and he called me get up on the fairgrounds today. He said, okay, well, I think she's got on, on her phone. So his wife was getting her shaft. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get it to the same thing. Right, yeah. Because first he said, that was very easy. He said, you pull in, the signs all over the place. He said, there's no kind of waiting line outside. I don't know about me. 